Good morning, church. Once again, I'd like to thank God and uh, Pastor Paul for giving me this opportunity to preach. You know, honestly, uh, when I was preparing this message, um, I imagined you being seated here, me preaching the word and we enjoying ourselves while learning more about God. But I guess this is, this is um, how God planned it all out. And um, it is strange. This season is uncertain in many aspects, in many areas, even eventful in many ways. Um, CMCO was announced in, uh, on Monday, sorry, and then we had an unexpected wedding that happened on Tuesday, really unexpected. Who would have imagined that at 6 p.m. we decided to have a wedding and it actually happened and it happened so beautifully and wonderfully, I still can remember all the bits of the wedding and it was just mind-blowing to think that God would do such an amazing thing in a, such a short period of time. And then the days that followed, we actually had our recording sessions and here we are today on a Sunday morning. But in all of that church, I just want you to know this. God has been faithful. He has been so, so faithful to each one of us in every aspect, in every area. You know, in this season of uncertainty, so many people are losing their jobs. So many people are losing their health, even mental health. But in our church, I hear people getting increase, increment starting new businesses, enjoying the Word of God, being so peaceful in these uncertain times. That is the evidence of God's faithfulness. And it's because that we present Him as the truth. Because we believe in the water, blood and spirit, we present Him as, a tru as the truth. And we can see the truth being manif manifested in our church. We see that He's Jehovah Jireh to us. He's our provider. He's our healer. So God's faithful to our church. He's always been. He was faithful then. He's faithful now. And He will always be faithful. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I have to say amen myself now. Because you are not here physically, but I believe you're saying amen at your homes, wherever you are. So why don't we just commit this time in prayer, church? Let's permit this time in prayer. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you, Father. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity, Father. Yes, Father, this season is full of uncertainty. Yes, this season is full of surprises. But we are going through this season with you, Father. And you are always so faithful to us, Father. And even today, Father, you are faithful to feed your people, Father, to feed your children, Father. And I pray that you use me as your vessel. Help me be obedient and submissive to your spirit so that whatever that I say, Father, would be in tune to what you want to say to your people. I pray that um, your people who are listening, whether they are um, at home, whether they are um, listening at a different time whatever father i pray that your word will go forth like a double-edged sword and that you would minister to their hearts we pray all this in jesus name amen 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 church when god gives he doesn't only give enough he gives in abundance you know, you remember the, the feeding of the 5,000? You know, he had two fish, two fish and five loaves of bread, and he fed 5,000 men. And they had 12 baskets full of, 12 baskets full of leftovers. And we're not even counting the women and the children who were there at that time. Another example would be um, the woman, the woman that had that one jar of oil left. Do you remember that woman? In the Old Testament, in 2 Kings chapter 4. 
Elijah visited her. And he said, you know, gather all the jars from your neighbors. And the oil kept pouring and pouring and pouring. The reason why it stopped was not because the oil ran out. It was because the jars weren't enough to contain the oil. So God gives in abundance. Sometimes it's an overflow, abundance, overflow. They're similar words. I know that seems pretty strange and uh, awkward to say in this season of lack, in this season of shortage, but that is his intention for you. I'm going to take you down to a portion of scripture in John chapter 4. would appreciate if you turn with me uh, to John chapter 4. If you have your Bibles with you, that would be great. So our source text is taken from John chapter 4, verse 3 to 15. So I'll read it for you. He left Judea and returned to Galilee. It was necessary for him to go through Samaria. And in doing so, he arrived at a Samaritan town called Sychar. Now, Sychar simply means end. Write that down. Trust me, it's going to make a lot of sense in a few moments. Near the tract of land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, remember? He's traveling from Judea to Galilee. Sat down by the well. It was then about the sixth hour. Now, if you go by the Jewish clock, and if you actually convert it to our clock, it's actually 12 p.m. Because they start their day at 6 a.m. So the sixth hour would mean 12 p.m. So this is hot, hot noon we're talking about here. And presently, when a woman of Samaria came along to draw water, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone off into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is that that you being a Jew, ask me a Samaritan and a woman, because men don't really speak to women at that time. I know it's true. It's true. It's true. Hard to accept, but that's, that's reality. That's how they lived back then. For a drink? For the Jews have nothing to do with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you had only known and had recognized God's gift and who this is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him instead. And he would have given you living water. And she said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, no drawing bucket, and the well is deep. How then can you provide living water? Where do you get your living water? Are you greater and superior to our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, who used to drink from it himself, his sons, and his cattle also? Jesus answered her, All who drink of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever takes a drink of the water that I will give him shall never, no, never, Jesus is saying never, no, never. So you better pay attention here. Be thirsty anymore. But the water that I will give him shall become a spring of water welling up, flowing, bubbling continually within him. Unto, into, for eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I may never get thirsty, nor have to come continually all the way here to draw. The title of my message today is Overflow. You know, when I was reading this portion of scripture, I realized this thing. Overflow is not a description, church. He is a man. 
And he is none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus is overflow. And Jesus wants you to experience overflow. That's his intention for us. He wants us to overflow, not only materially, but in mind, in health, in body, spiritually. Point number one, encounter. Now, before you can experience overflow, you have to meet overflow first. John 4, verse 3 to 4. Let me read it to you. And this is all from our source text today. He left Judea and returned to Galilee. And it was necessary for him to go through Samaria. Now, before I can even jump into um, the message and what I'm going to explain, I need to give you some context first. I always say context is key. Now, you need to know that the Jews and the Samaritans hate each other. They can't see eye to eye. In fact, um, the Jews call Samaritans pigs, dogs, half-breeds. And you might be wondering why half-breeds. It's because uh, during those days in the Old Testament when the Assyrians actually conquered northern Israel, they, 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 they brought in their people, they intermarried, and they, they became this group of people called Samaritans. And now, these people developed a new religion. You can trust me on this because I've done my research. And it's part Judaism, part pagan worship. And the Jews really, really were disgusted with these people, and they hated them. I'm just going to show you this map right here. And so this is a map of Israel at the time of Jesus, the first century AD. You can see that this is Judea and this is Galilee. So if the Jews were traveling from Judea to Galilee, instead of passing through Samaria, they would actually go to Peria, pass through Decapolis, and then head to Galilee. They would never pass Samaria because they couldn't see eye to eye. So there was this great divide between the Jews and the Samaritans. And as I was just taking that in, God revealed this to me. Son, does this remind you of something? Does this remind you of something? Does this remind you of how men and God's relationship was? Well, you have a fellowship with me now. But isn't there a great divide between men and God? And the reason for that separation, as we discussed in Show Me The Way, do you remember that one? Was sin. Sin was the barrier. There was a great divide between God and men. We couldn't enter His presence because He's holy and we are unholy. So what differentiates us with people in the world? Why today we can have a relationship with Him, have a fellowship with Him, have fellowship with Him, but they not so? Why? And it's because of these two scriptures that I'm going to read to you right now. Verse 5, And in doing so, he arrived at a Samaritan town called Sychar, near the tract of land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Remember, I told you to write down the meaning of Sychar? Saika simply means end. Jacob simply means supplanter, 
cheat, con man, and sinner. Only when you come to the end of yourself and when you realize that you're a sinner, that you're a cheat, that you can never appease God's holiness, only then will the manifold grace, the overflowing grace of God meet you. Do you get that? Only when you come to your psyche, to the end of yourself, and recognize that you are a Jacob. Jacob's well ran dry. Jacob's well was deficient, insufficient. When you recognize that, the grace of God, the overflowing grace of God, will appear at that well. At that place. And that's why in John 1 17, it says this. I have to refer to my Bible here. For while the law was given through Moses, grace, undeserved favor, spiritual blessing, and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace made his way into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. And grace came to meet you at that well. When you realize, when you come to the end of yourself and realize that you are a sinner. He came for us. While we were still sinners, it's not that we were looking for him. We were searching for him. That Samaritan woman didn't search for Jesus. Jesus came to her. I was always thinking before that when the scripture says it was necessary for him to go through Samaria, I thought that was because of geographical reasons. I thought there was no other way. But as we saw just now, you could actually bypass Samaria. The reason why he, the scripture said he had to go to Samaria is because that woman was there. He had to go through Samaria. Not because there was no other route, because somebody came to the end of him or herself and realize that they were a sinner and immediately the abundant manifold grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ would appear at that place. And the woman knew that she was a sinner. For it said in the scripture that she came at noon. Nobody collects water at noon, church. Even in those days. Even now, who collects water at midday? It's so hot. People don't even go out for a drink. Who collects water? People usually collect water in the morning, in the evening, but not at midday. She did that because she recognized and she knew herself that she was a sinner. And we, we, we learn further in the text that she had five husbands, before and she was living with a boyfriend. She was living in sin. That's why she came at midday. See, Samaritans were already hated, but she was even hated within her own community. And God doesn't overlook that person. When you come to the end of yourself, when you realize that you are a sinner, immediately, immediately the abundant manifold grace of God would appear in your life. If you still think that you are righteous in your own flesh, that you are good in your own flesh, that you can make it to God, into His presence, by your own works, by your own standing, by your own righteousness, the abundant grace of God will not appear. He came for the sick, not for the healthy. The sinner for the righteous. 
So when we want to meet him, the first thing to do is to recognize and to come to your psyche. And then to realize that you are a Jacob. And then the manifold grace will appear in your life. Point number two, exchange. Now let's turn to John chapter 4, verse 7. Presently, when a woman of Samaria came along to draw water, Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone off into town to buy food. Probably they were hungry. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you being a Jew ask me a Samaritan and a woman for a drink? For the Jews have nothing to do with the Samaritans. And we've gone through this and we know why she said this. In verse 10, this is where I want you to pay close attention, church. Jesus answered her, If you had only known and had recognized God's gift and who this is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have you would have asked him instead and he would have given you living water. I'm going to stop it at that. The overflow that God's talking about, Jesus, is a gift of grace. It is something that we can't work for and earn on our own. We can't experience overflowing peace, overflowing joy, overflowing love, by working for it. It is not received like that. It is received as an act of grace. And as I told you earlier, grace made entrance into the world through the person of Jesus Christ. So grace offered that Samaritan an exchange. And let's read what happens. And she said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, no drawing bucket, and the well is deep. How then can you provide living water? Where do you get your living water? Are you greater than, superior to our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, who used to drink from it himself, and his sons, and his cattle also? Jesus answered her, All who drink of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever takes a drink of the water that I will give him shall never, no, never be thirsty anymore. But the water that I will give him shall become a spring of water, welling up, flowing, bubbling continually within him unto, into for eternal life. If only that woman knew that he wasn't talking about some ordinary water from some ordinary well. If only that woman knew that overflow was talking to her. She didn't need a bucket. All she needed was faith. If she partook of the living water, she become one with him, die with him, and rise with him to everlasting life. Jesus' church is overflow. He's overflow. And he's offering himself to her and i didn't realize this i didn't realize this but this whole portion of scripture was actually talking about salvation all along coming to psyche coming to the end of yourself realizing that you were a sinner that's how we got saved right and then what happens you drink of the living water which is simply uniting with him and we know what un uniting with him means being baptized into him. And then he goes on to say, But the water that I will give him shall become a spring of water welling up, flowing, bubbling continually within him unto eternal life. Do you know what that is? Do you know who that is? It's the Spirit of God. Let's just take a look at John 7 was 38 
the 39. He who believes in me, who cleaves to and trusts in and relies on me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow springs and rivers of living water. But he was speaking here of the Spirit. I don't think so, I know so, because the scripture has said. He was talking about the Spirit. Uniting with him, drinking of the living water, is being baptized into him. And the springs of living water that flows out is the Holy Spirit. The gospel of water and spirit was being preached to this woman. And this was a revelation to me. He was talking about salvation all along. Overflow church comes with salvation. There's no getting overflow without salvation. Jesus is the overflow. And the woman accepted that exchange. Because when we read in John 4, verse 15, it says this, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never get thirsty nor have to come continually all the way here to draw. She accepted the exchange. Have we? Have we accepted the exchange? Number three, experience. You know, when I read John 4, verse 15, yes, she accepted the exchange, but she didn't really understand what it was. She thought the living water would only satisfy her thirst, her human thirst. And yes, the living water will satisfy your needs in this world, but when God gives church, remember this, He doesn't give one fold. He gives many fold. The living water would be with her all the days of her life. The living water would give her peace, love, joy, and all the fruit of the Spirit that we sang a few moments ago. All the days of her life, all throughout her life, God, when He gives, He gives in abundance. He gives many fold. And when Jesus, and when Jesus had um, revealed Himself to her, because remember, she didn't quite get it at the beginning. When He revealed that He was the Messiah, guess what happened? Check this out. In John 4, verse 28. Then the woman left her water jar and went away to the town. And she began telling the people. You know, once you experience overflow, you will leave your jar of water behind. You will leave the lack, the insufficiency, the deficiency in your very own human well. Because you experience overflow. That's what the woman did. She left it behind. She left it behind and she went into town. This is the woman that went to collect water at noon. She was so afraid of what people would think of her. She was despised in the community. She didn't even want to meet people who came by the well. This is the same woman after experiencing overflow, went to the heart of town where people dwelled because she experienced overflow. And she began telling her fellow Samaritans because she wanted them to experience 
the same overflow. And as we read further in the scripture, we find out that those whom she shared with also received Jesus and they experienced their overflow too. Jesus Church is overflow. But have we experienced overflow? That's the question today. Have we experienced overflow? Why are we not experiencing overflow? Well, maybe you're drinking from the wrong well. Maybe you're drinking from the wrong well. And maybe you are drinking from a well that runs dry, but Jesus is offering you a well that will never run dry. A well that doesn't only meet your need now, but will meet your needs forever. Because it overflows. It's living water. Who's Jesus himself. If you're listening to this and you have not received overflow, if you've not received Jesus, maybe it's time to make that exchange. Maybe it's time to make that trade. But if you have believed in this gospel, church, and I'm talking to you, if you have received the gospel and you're not experiencing overflow, maybe we're drinking from the wrong well, even though we have access to the living water. Because I tell you this, the devil is going to try everything he can to distract you from the living water. He's going to try and make you rely on Jacob's well for your needs. But you know the outcome of Jacob's well. You know what would happen when you drink from Jacob's well. You have to continually come back again and again and again. And soon when the well runs dry in a drought, you wouldn't have anything else to drink. But you have overflow and we need to be very, very careful and vigilant that we do not fall into his trap of drinking from water that runs dry, but drinking the living water. In this season of lack, of shortage, He wants to give you access. He wants to give you an overflow. And the only way that we can have access and an overflow is only in Christ. When overflow flows from the innermost being, from within us, this overflow, what happens is when we drink from Jacob's well, it's outward. But when we drink from the living water, it is inward. And it is from the inside where it lasts. Because it is the living water who is from the inside. And that's why the scripture says, The water that I will give him shall become a spring of water, welling up, flowing, bubbling continually from within. From within him unto eternal life and that is for you church I'm done with my message I pray church that this message today spoke to you I didn't say many things but I hope you get the point that Jesus is overflow. Jesus is overflow. But if you're receiving Jesus for the first time, wherever you are, if you want to receive him right now, let's pray this prayer together. 
Father, thank you, Father, for giving me and offering me overflow. I know, Father, that there's no way I can have overflow in my life unless I receive Jesus. And I truly believe, Father, in the baptism where all my sins were passed upon Jesus by John the Baptist, who is my representative. I believe in your death. This is where, Father, that is where all my sins were paid for in full because the wages of sin is death. And I believe, Father, in Jesus' resurrection because when he rose again, my faith is valid and true and his spirit now overflow indwells in me and I experience and I can experience overflow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.